Our castaway this week is the distinguished director and designer of plays and operas and films, Franco Zeffirelli. Signor Zeffirelli, what in the main has motivated your choice of eight discs? Is it personal nostalgia or great performances? What? Oh, I imagine is what you expect from me. Uh, selected pieces because they meant something particular to me. Mm -hmm. They are associated with uh, happy moments of my life as and soothing the bad moments for me and uh, like only music and sound can do. Are you a musician? Can you read a score? Well, very badly. I mean, this has been one of the uh, strange uh, things in my career because I've, I've done a lot of opera. I've done about 46 new productions. Mm -hmm. I've worked with the greatest singers and conductors. What's the first record you've chosen? The first thing that comes to my mind is to save my, the voice of Maria Callas and uh, the music written by Bizet. There are, to me, two pillars of opera ever. Uh, Callas is his dear friend who just uh, left us, was what she was, and I don't need now to add anything to uh, what people know about her or have said about her. Uh, Bizet is uh, undoubtedly one of the greatest geniuses of, uh, of the musical planet. Though I, uh, you know, I adore Verdi, I adore Bellini, Puccini, Donizetti, uh, you know, the greatest pillars of our, of our operatic world, but Bizet to me means something very special. <laughs> Maria Callas as Carmen. Where did you learn your very fluent English? Mm, it's a long story. I started uh, when I was a child, practically. One of the ambitions of my father who was a rather simple man. I mean, he was a businessman. He imported uh, clothes from all over the world in Florence. He didn't know languages, and he suffered from that. Mm. So he said, my son must know languages. The first thing he has to learn, even if I have to sell my last... Uh, you know, jewel or ring or whatever he had, uh, he has to learn languages. So he forced me at the age of eight, practically, to go and learn uh, French and English. Then there was uh, the sanctions in 1935, 36, and uh, English uh, at the time was, was very much out of fashion. Mussolini put uh, a veto. Yes. We could not speak English, so I, I forgot. And only when the war uh, came and I crossed the lines and joined the army, your mm. liberation. And I happened to 
be made prisoner by um, the first regiment of Scotch Guards. And I could hardly speak English, but uh, suddenly it all came back. In a matter of uh, one week, it came back, and uh, as a matter of fact, I remained with them as an interpreter. Yes. And since then, I never, never stopped speaking English. Now, your mother was a designer, wasn't she? She was uh, a fashion creator, actually. She mm -hmm. had a great um, fashion business. She was was it that that inspired you to go to art school? No, my mother died. I was six, and so I ah. didn't have much influence in my later choices. But perhaps she, you know, left me some kind of message in my very young mind that that, that was perhaps the, the way to follow. And after art school... You studied architecture. I actually uh, went to art school thinking of uh, stage designing and architecture. And I studied architecture in Florence, then the war came, I interrupted the studies, and uh, after the war, I joined the theatre. It yes. was my you had, passion. You had got mixed up with the theatre a little bit with the British forces, hadn't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> what were they doing? What sort of theatre? Uh, I remember I was, uh, I'd been uh, two months already with the British troops, and uh, the, mm, the regiment I was with had finally uh, a leave. They had 15 days rest. So they were withdrawn from the front line, and they were sent back in a, in a very pleasant um, villa near Siena. And uh, they asked me how you know if I could organize this uh, this st stage and theater for them, and I did a little masterpiece apparently because I remember at one point uh, everything was ready. A few hours before the show began, uh, captain of the Scotch Guards, and uh, you wouldn't believe is uh, the great uh, ballet uh, expert and critic Richard uh, Buckle. Uh, Buckle. He was serving as a captain. Uh, he came there and looked at this. He said, who has done this? It really was uh, rather extraordinary. I used the camouflage nets and the back of the tracks. I created a real open-air theater. Mm. And uh, I was introduced to him, and he said, well, you must have uh, must watch this boy, because it, uh, I'm sure you are going to have a career. And then I met him later at Covent Garden, and uh, he said, I know, I know, I know. I told you. <laughs> so that was the end of architecture. You joined a theater company. Yeah, that was it. You as started an as an actor. Yeah, as How an long actor. I was that? doing everything, you know. I think when you are young, you must do everything mm -hmm. until you find, uh, like, you know, with women, you must go with a lot of women, and then you select the one which is right for you. you right. Know, same thing. And it was during that acting period that you met Visconti, who was to yeah. have a, a great influence on you. Yeah, tremendous, yes. I worked as an actor with him, then as designer. I assisted Salvador Dali, who designed a, a quite an extraordinary... Um, uh, as, as you, you like, like it. it. And then the year uh, following year, it was going to give me the chance of uh, designing a show, which was the first Italian production of Streetcar Named Desire. And yes. That's how I start. <laughs>
let's have your next record. What's it to be? I like to hear... Well, that's another appointment you cannot miss. I mean, Beethoven is Beethoven. We can't think of being in any island, forgotten island, without hearing some of his music every now and then. And the one that particularly moves me and soothes me and really brings back peace in my heart whenever I'm nervous or tired is the adagio from the Ninth Symphony. The opening of the third movement of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, Carian conducting the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. You began in opera, of course, as a designer. No, a designer uh, began, uh, as I said to you, as you like it, and then uh, Trollus and Cressida, always with Visconti. But yes. the first opportunity as a director I had from opera. Ah, what La Scala, because La Scala called me after... Having seen my works as a designer, they called me to design an opera by Rossini, yes. the Italiana in Algeri. And uh, in those years, I wanted very badly to switch from uh, designing to directing. I said, well, I'll do it only if I can also direct. They said, well, never do it. The designer also directs. But if you insist, all right. So they gave me the, the opportunity of designing and directing my first production, Ella Scala, which was quite, for me, a tremendous uh, you know, starting event. at the top. Starting really at the top, <laughs> and it was a great success. And then I did uh, Cenerentola, then I did, uh, I specialized in Rossini's operas, then I did uh, uh, Turco in Italia with Maria Callas, that's the first time I worked with her in 1955. What that's was your first overseas engagement? The first overseas engagement was in Dallas, Texas. I went there and produced again Italian and Algeri and Traviata with Callas in 58. Then you came and did a rejuvenation job at Covent Garden. Some of our productions were very old indeed at that time. They are old now too. My productions at Covent Garden are very are getting very old and tired too. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> it's fate, the destiny of time. <laughs> oh, there was a very distinguished list of eight or nine of them you did in the late fifties or oh, early sixties, and most of them, as you say, are still in use. I spend my happiest days in opera on the stage of Covent Garden. I'm really. There was that I'm memorable so Tosca you did oh, with this, uh, Maria Callas and Tito Gobbi. Yes, it was a wonderful evening. Yes, wonderful. And you worked several times with Joan Sutherland. Actually, we practically made our debut together. She was uh, quite unknown when uh, we staged together the um, Lucia. Yes. It was my debut and her debut. Actually, debut, at least she had been singing uh, for quite a while, but never had this kind of tremendous opportunity of uh, being able to sing that kind of piece. And, of course, she did uh, Handel's Alcina. We did Handel's and Puritania. Yes. Alcina, a very small opera, but you made it a very big opera. 
Well, you know, <laughs> it, I, I think we succeeded in making it very entertaining. Yes. Because, you know, normally Handel is considered with reverence and uh, in the end comes out as a very boring author. He's not at all. Your critics have, have accused you of, of um, overdoing it, of being too elaborate, of overwhelming the musical side with the spectacle. Do you think that's ever been justified? I don't know. You should ask the audience, not the critics. <coughs> that's good sense. Let's have another record. Well, I think it has with just talked about um, that marvelous uh, moment of my life when uh, we opened with Lucia the 11th of February, 1959, at Covent Garden. And we were, both uh, Southern and myself, rocketed to the sky like new stars. And we held hands together during tremendous ovations that uh, followed the, the end of that opera that marvelous evening. And I'd like to remember and hear with you the great moment of the mad scene sung superbly by John Sutherland. Joan Sutherland as Lucia di Lammermoor. Now, your work in the straight theatre, many plays in Italy, of course. Your first production in English was at the Old Vic, I think. Yes, it was, actually. It took me by, um, by total surprise. I never directed any play ever in my life, let alone Shakespeare in English. So when uh, 
Uh, my dear friend Michael Bentel, who died a few years ago, a wonderful man, he called me. I was in Milano rehearsing La Scala, a new piece, and um, he called me. I didn't know him. He said, I'm Michael Bentel, old Vic, etc., etc. We'd like you to direct for us next year a new production of Roman Juliet. And I thought absolutely... I was convinced it was a joke of some, some uh, friends of mine in London. So I said, all right, only if the Queen asked me to do it, I will do it. <laughs> and I hung up the telephone. And then Michael wrote me a letter immediately after, in which he said, no, it is really serious. In fact, there was you know, the old big paper and so on. So I couldn't believe my luck, and I was taken by fright, total of panic. How can I do it? And then uh, I say a little prayer. And during the night, I made a wonderful dream that I uh, would have had a great success. So <laughs> and I you did, indeed. It. Did. it was a sensation. Yeah. And since then, you've directed several Shakespeare plays in Italian. And in English, too. Yeah, oh, yes. Uh, 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 Othello at uh, Stratford. Othello at Stratford, uh, Sir John Gilgood, and uh, Much Ado About Nothing at the, in the National Theatre again. Yes. But I did, um, I did Hamlet in Italy, mm-hmm. and I did another production of Roman Juliet in Italy, which toured the, the world. The National Theatre did a, a modern Italian play by Eduardo de Filippo, yes. um, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, with Laurence Olivier and Joan Playwright. The great problems, you think, in, in teaching um, English actors brought up in the tradition of Gerald de Maurier to, to act with their hands, to speak with their hands in the Italian manner? I deny that <laughs> the qualification of the English actors. The English actors can really do anything they want, if they want it. So I had no problem, actually, if there was a problem, was to restrain the participation to this uh, new experience. Fortunately, I had already been through that company, uh, through Much Ado About Nothing, where re- really we unleashed all the Italian style, Italian gags, Italian characterizations. Mm. So when it came down to Eduardo's uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I had no problem making them look and sound Italian. Uh, perhaps even too much, I don't know, but the, the play was a kind of gallery of very wild characters. It's quite different from the play 
I just put on now the lyric. Philomena. Right. Philomena is by the same author, but this is a very serious play. Though there is uh, that blend of humor and tears that is so typical of Eduardo and it's what makes him so likable by the English. I mean, the English audience are very grateful to him because he gives them both colors and he knows superbly how to blend them. But this is a very serious play. Record number four. You'll be surprised. I, uh, I like very much contemporary music, especially the music of the young people. And I think if I look back at, uh, because I've seen developing this kind of uh, music, as I remember distinctly when it started, and I think one of the turning points has been the arrival on our radios and um, uh, television, the great uh, group, the Platters. I can never live without hearing every now and then, only you. <laughs> with Visconti on several films with him. Have yes, you I did, uh, I think, three films. The, the most beautiful experience in my life was uh, being an assistant uh, in La Terra Trema, which the film was shot in Sicily with fishermen and real people, mm -hmm. no actors. And you also worked with De Sica? I did uh, a, so a short episode with him, a second assistant, and uh, with Visconti again, Senso, and the film with uh, Magnani, Bellissima. The first film on your own was... The Taming of the Shrew. No, I had done a little film. A lousy little picture, but very funny and very amusing. We enjoyed doing it in 58. It was called Camping. It made a lot of money, actually, but, uh, well, it wasn't exactly in the beginning of a career. <laughs> no, the, the beginning of the career was obviously The Taming of the Shrew. You went to the Renaissance painters for, for the visual side of that. Well, it was inevitable, I'm afraid. It took place in Padua, and we recreated this legendary Padua... All, it was entirely rebuilt in the studios. It had a kind of artificial, very near a theatrical experience. I, I didn't want to risk much, you know. The first time I approached um, this new medium, I wasn't really that young, and I had already a reputation. I didn't want to, you know, to risk too much. 
And also because I thought that Shakespeare on the screen is always a tremendous uh, source of uh, ideas and um, inspiration. And that particular piece was perfectly suitable for those two monsters, uh, Taylor and Burton, yes. who really did it, I think, very well. A year later, I picked up two unknown and uh, brought them to the attention of the world audience with the Roman Juliet. I dealt with it in an entirely different key. Two English teenagers? Yes. Mm -hmm. Olivia Hasse and Lena Whiting. And you did the same thing for Brother Sun, Sister Moon, the story of St. Francis yeah. of Assisi. You found two unknowns. Oh, yes. Uh, they're over, they were all um, newcomers, uh, new English. And you took on that daunting assignment, the story of Jesus for television, six hours, was it not? Yeah, well, yes. Yes, it was, uh, it scared me. Then again, I said a little prayer, and one night I dreamt it would have been a great success. Right, this part that you mentioned casually, <laughs> the part that one might term the, the part of all time. Uh, yes, I mean, it's the part that no actor in his right mind would ever want to play. And it's the part that no actor can really turn down once he's been asked to do it. And thank God it doesn't actually come up that often. Or right, let's stop hedging. This was uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Did you hesitate before accepting? Oh, very much so, yes. The crucifixion sequence must have been terribly harrowing to do. Yes, indeed it was. It took about five months to shoot, in fact, uh, on and off. I was always threatened by Franco if I misbehaved that I would go back up on the cross. Franco Zeffrelli? Yes. Um, and we were very dependent on bad weather to shoot it. Uh, he wanted a certain heavy clouds behind. I remember one particular day, he s set the camera. I was on the cross, and we'd been doing, been working all day, and I'd been up there for many hours, and we'd been shooting the little bits and pieces. And suddenly, behind my head, Franco had obviously seen something in the sky that I hadn't, didn't know about. And he said, Robert, we're going to turn the camera now. Please, you do the whole of the crucifixion scene. It is wonderful behind your head. It's the most beautiful scene behind your head. So I said, what do you mean, the whole thing? He said, the whole thing, do everything, one after the other. I said, including the death. He said, yes, and, and including the death. And so I did each moment from the crucifixion, one after the other, and finally arrived at the moment when I was about to die. And obviously, to pull myself together, I paused and got myself into it. And suddenly, and this is all on film, too, <laughs> somewhere in the archives, the voice from behind camera goes, Go on, Robert. Die, 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 die. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Somewhere in the archives of ITC.
Another record, please. Oh, another record. Now, wait a minute. I wouldn't go on a desert island without bringing with me the most extraordinary voice of any actor ever, Sir Lawrence Olivier, Lord Olivier, in uh, immemorable, unforgettable messages left to us in his uh, early Harry the Fifth from the film. It was absolutely bizarre when I saw it. I must have seen it five or t six times. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock or a hang and jutty his confounded base swelled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn to leave and fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slip, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit. And upon this charge, cry God for Harry, England and St. George! <laughs> the voice of Laurence Olivier. Yes. Have you any professional ambitions still unfulfilled? One play you want to get your teeth into? One play? Yes. I'd like to get my teeth into Or one opera? Opera. Or uh, one film subject you've never been opera, able to set yes, up? yes, yes. There is one film I would like to do. And I will do one day. Is Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do it. You've tried to set that up before? Yeah, but um, I wasn't lucky you know, in the setup. I have something I want to do one day. That's the film. Plays, I mean, plays, there are so many, one more beautiful than the other. I'd like to do Three Sisters, but Shekhov. I'd like to do many plays. I mean, there are many Shakespeare's I haven't done yet.
whatnot. Yes. There is one piece which uh, I really like to hear over and over again. It's a, a, a Gregorian chant. It's uh, one of the most gentle and sweet and beautiful. And it's called Salve Regina. It's a prayer to the Virgin. And it reminds me of the many times I went to church with my mother and my elders and, uh, and uh, heard this beautiful hymn. I'd like to hear it again. Salve Regina, sung by the choir of the Benedictine Abbey of Santo Domingo de Silos. Now, you design scenery, could you build it? And you can cleat something together on your desert island to make a shelter, can you? I told you about uh, what I did in the rest camp during the war. It was practically done with nothing. <laughs> Camouflage tents, uh, flowers, uh, branches, and it was done with rocks. Mm -hmm. So I presume I'll make a marvelous, beaut beautiful, in inventive work with the mat natural material I would find on that island. Would you try to escape? I don't know. I don't know. It depends what uh, I find there, what I can create there, if I can adjust to it. If I can adjust to it, I will never escape. Right. Record number seven now. Now, you'll be surprised. There is one piece that really has impressed me, I'll never forget because I happened to be there when uh, it was launched and exploded. I don't know if you remember the end of the 50s. The famous uh, Peppermint Lounge in New York. Chubby Checker launching the twist. Chubby checker, let's twist again. I've forgotten how to do it. <laughs> oh, I, I can't tell you. It was such a furore when it happened. I happened to be in New York on my way from Dallas. And we went there, guess with whom? With Maria Callas and Leonard Bernstein. Because we couldn't. I mean, we were ashamed. They were very ashamed to go in that kind of place. So they disguised themselves, you know. And we, as soon as we entered, we couldn't enter. Nobody recognized Bernstein. He was, he was quite furious because he was dressed like a um, truck driver. <clears throat> Finally, somebody recognized him, and we could go in. And there, in a corner, up on the ladder, was Greta Garbo. So I tell you what. <laughs> and uh, we all wanted to dance, but uh, we couldn't. You know, we didn't have the trick. Then finally, uh, Lenny called one of these dancers and said, "Come with us, because we can't go around in the world today without knowing how to dance a twist." So a whole night in front of a mirror, the four of us trying to twist, and finally Maria shouted, I've got it! I've got it! I've got it! <laughs> now, your last record, what's that? I think the overture of Barbara Seville. Why? By Rossini. It makes me happy, the music of Rossini. It cheers me up. 
no matter how gloomy or depressed I can be or tired, I hear his music and uh, the sun shines again. BC Symphony Orchestra playing the overture to the Barbara Seville, conducted by Arturo Toscanini. If you could take just one of the eight discs you've played to us, which would it be? I think I'll keep uh, the team uh, Carlos Bizet with me. Right, Carmen. And one luxury to have with you. Can it be perfume? Oh, it can be perfume, sir. Uh, because I imagine through what you say, there are no good scents in that island unless... You bring some uh, good seeds from abroad. <laughs> um, well, I'll take my perfume, yes. Hammam bouquet, made by Penaligon in London. Right. A large flacon. And one book, apart from that little list that we have put aside, the Bible and Shakespeare and big encyclopedias. Well, as the real uh, treat, I'll uh, ask you to give me a good uh, edition of uh, War and Peace. <laughs> Thank you, Franco Zeffirelli, for letting us hear your Desert Island discs. Thank you very much. This is a very pleasant uh, chat. I wish we could continue. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.